thank you and welcome. Uh, thank you, welcome and hello from, from San Francisco at the moment. Um, so um, as Sophia said, I'm Eric Varela. I'm gonna be talking to you about my experiences evaluating uh, programs at the intersection of technology and philanthropy. So my over, the overview for my talk is gonna be, who the heck am I? Uh, starting, starting with telling you a little bit about myself and then what salesforce.org is and how we go about evaluating our programs, uh, talking about the evaluation framework I've helped to set up there. And then taking it a bit broader to talk about um, some issues when trying to um, evaluate in this, in this intersection. What are some things to, to consider if you, want to, if you want to go in this direction? And then finally, from my experience, thinking about some useful skills to have if you want to, if you want to enter this sector. So first off, who, who the heck am I? Aside from being an evaluator, I, I, I am a couple of other things. I, I am an uncle to a, a, a wonderful three and a half year old nephew named Cameron, and we're trying to get him uh, to become a doctor as soon as possible. I am also a cat dad to Poncho, the, uh, the judgingest cat on the planet. And I also am a repeat attendee of this festival called Burning Man out in the Nevada desert every year. It helps to ground me and helps to, uh, helps me, I think, to do some, some good evaluation work. So it's a little bit more about me aside from, aside from my evaluation work. But also uh, giving you a little bit of, of, of insight into my training and experience. So I am one of the, uh, I am one of the few, I think, um, really emerging group of, of people who received a lot of training, uh, a lot of university training in evaluation. Um, I was fortunate enough to get a master's from the University of Colorado Boulder, where I studied under Dr. Ernie House and uh, learned a lot about social justice evaluation. And then went on to get my PhD from UCLA, where I worked with, um, with Dr. Marvin Alkin and uh, Dr. Christina Christie, really around, um, again, around, around evaluation and evaluation theories and, and was able to, you know, was able to use that of it, use all of that information to work primarily as an internal evaluator. So the second column here is really focused on organizations I've worked for. So I've worked, done an evaluation in large, in kind of large school districts, uh, in small nonprofits and NGOs, and now at this kind of hybrid philanthropic organization, technology organization called salesforce.org. Um, I've also been involved in, you know, in the evaluation community in, in, various, in various aspects, um, have led the San Francisco Bay Area Evaluators Group, have gotten involved in Merle Tech, uh, monitoring evaluation research and learning technology, really focused on evaluators in the international aid space, and I'm also um, very involved with the American Evaluation Association. I'm currently on the board of directors of the American Evaluation Association in the interest of full disclosure. So that's a little bit more about me and kind of how I'll be, how I really um, f approach reflecting on my work. Because um, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of university training, but I've also had a lot of, um, I've also had a lot of internal training, um, internal evaluation training, and I will, I will slow down. Uh, so, so that's really where, where my mindset is, as I think about the work that I do, really thinking about it from an internal perspective, but hopefully having some application both internally as well as, you know, for external evaluators out there. So starting with what salesforce.org is and, and how we evaluate our, our programs. Salesforce.org is the nonprofit social enterprise arm of Salesforce.com, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, Salesforce.com is a global customer relationship and management software company. So at Salesforce.org, we believe that everyone who wants to change the world should have the technology to, to do so. So we, um, we offer up our technology, our Salesforce technology, to um, nonprofits, registered charities, and equivalents all over the world, um, at a at either a, you know at a, either free price point or a you know, drastically reduced price point, um, and that money ends up f um, feeding at a, feeding our grant making in education and workforce development, as well as employee giving, so employee volunteering and employee donation matching. So. 
at salesforce.org, we're this hybrid of a nonprofit social enterprise, a grant making institution, and, and an employee giving you know, corporate social responsibility manager. So my challenge when I got to salesforce.org four years ago as the, the first um, M&E uh, a staff member there was to ask about the impact that we wanted to have. And people couldn't really tell me beyond we want to change the world or we want people to change the world. People could point to our mission, but we weren't really, people just, people just knew that we were doing good work. They didn't necessarily know what it is that we were trying to do or what the impact is that we were trying to have. So we focused on this, on this top statement around our mission. I mean, this really is our mission that the more missions our technology supports, the more we can invest back, creating an endless circle of good. So what we what we try to do with that is take each of those three areas, our technology, our, um, our strategic grants, which is the investment in future ready leaders, and the community engagement around our employee giving. And I worked with the organization for a really long time to figure out what the impact was we wanted to have in each of these areas. So the statements below are those three statements around accelerating social sector impact, around creating and supporting an inclusive and diverse workforce, and around creating and supporting um, citizen philanthropists you know, among, among our employees. So now people finally had you know, impact statements to, to hang their hats on to be able to say, oh, this is what we're trying to do. Um, I think in, in pretty much all of our organizations, we, we want to be able to evaluate based on our organization's purpose or based on an organization's purpose. And so this was my way of figuring out what it is our purpose actually was. And so what we've been able to do is take those statements and align them to our various programs. So. For technology, for a technology program, you know, we have we have solutions for nonprofits, for education institutions, as well as now for companies wanting to broaden their philanthropic efforts. Then for our strategic grants, like I said, education and workforce development, and then we have our community engagement. So in each of these, our programs are now aligned to these these various impact statements. So this is something that probably in many organizations that you work for or work with, it may already be there, uh, but this was new for Salesforce. This was really not something that they had um, that that they had tried to do in the past. So this was my uh, this was my attempt to align our work and to define it, especially given that the three areas, these three portfolio areas, are kind of they're kind of disparate in terms of technology grants and an employee giving. So this was my way of trying to bring everything, bring everything together. And so like I said, really the challenge is these things are somewhat disparate. disparate. Um, another challenge is when I started four years ago, I was, I believe employee number 142. And now we will probably have by the end of the year, upwards of a thousand employees just at salesforce.org, not the entire company. So there's been exponential growth. And so with that, you know, there are a lot of different teams working in, in very, very different areas. I work with a lot of salespeople, which is, which is kind of new for, for me, given where I've evaluated in the past. And so you've got lots of teams, you have a lot of different kinds of work, uh, but everybody's trying to get to the same goal. So at least I've been able to define what that goal actually is. And this is probably familiar for many of you. Uh, the way that I've actually worked with this organization, with, with Salesforce.org, is to create a bunch of logic models. Uh, there, more than anything, I think they're a documentation for, for me and for my colleague to be able to see what kind of work needs to be, needs to be done and how their work aligns to our overall impact. Um, they, I, I made sure to not make them too, too cumbersome and they've really caught on. So I have teams coming to, to me 
saying, hey, we want to do a logic model. We want something that's going to tell us how our, how our efforts align to our organization's ultimate, ultimate intended impact. And so again, it's a way of just documenting and to align everything. So every portfolio has a logic model. Every program has a logic model. A lot of departments and individual teams are now developing them as well. Um, it's it's something that I didn't I didn't think would catch on the way it has, but again, it allows for people to to document and really see what it is like how how everything they're doing is fitting in. So, so there's a there's a transparency aspect to it that I think is is really is really important. And you know, and, and people people said, well, you're you're Salesforce, you know, you're this cutting edge technology company. You're just doing logic models, and I said, yes, <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes those those basic elements are are kind of fundamental for a reason, and so I found that the logic modeling process has actually been very very useful. Um, and I think really I think regardless of the um, of the field or sector you're you're evaluating in, um, there's there's I think there's a lesson to be learned there. And so we ultimately came up with um, from all these logic models we came up with an outcomes framework. Now, for an organization like Salesforce.org, this is this is pretty revolutionary and pretty bold because in the corporate philanthropy sector, using outputs as proxies for impact is is accepted and 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 unfortunately acceptable. So an organization can talk about the number of hours they've volunteered or the, you know, the amount of money they've given, they've given out and say, hey, this is the kind of impact that we're having. And we at Salesforce are, are saying that's not really enough. You know, as we know, social impact goes far beyond what an organization does. And really, really, you need to look at the beneficiaries. So, so instead of saying, you know, we have, you know, we have so many thousand customers, we're saying we want to know if our customers are becoming more effective at, at, at fulfilling their missions, are being able to collaborate better in their communities, are be able are being able to innovate better. Um, in turn, instead of just saying the you know the amount of money that we're giving out, we're saying, are students actually performing better um, academically? Are the interns who go through the programs we support finding jobs, retaining jobs, learning skills, and improving their wages? And instead, instead of saying, well, this is the number of hours that we're volunteering, we're saying, you know, are our employees actually engaging in meaningful philanthropy and our organizations actually improving because of it? So, so for us, having this outcomes framework um, is actually a differentiator for many in, in, our, in, in our sector because it allows us to, to go beyond ourselves, beyond just reporting vanity metrics, which are those outputs, and really get to, get to outcomes. And so the way that this has manifested itself is this year, um, I'm very proud that we released our very first Salesforce.org social impact report. And it was really a way to get the outcomes framework out with some of the data, uh, with, with, some, with whatever data that we, that we currently have. Um, you know, we, we didn't identify some of the data sources we needed until this past year. So next year's report's gonna be much bigger, but at least this year, we have something that we can share that, that, that is publicly available that you can you go online and, and download and just say, hey, we're, we want to pivot the, we want to pivot the sector. We want to pivot the sector toward outcomes and not just resting on, on their outputs. And so this is, this is our way of, of saying, you know, hey, we're doing it, come, come join us. So in terms of early successes, um, one of the things that, that we're finding that I'm that I'm really finding is that my colleagues are really starting to care about impact management and, and about evaluation. Uh, they're sharing their report with their with their customers. You know, our salespeople are sharing the report with their customers. Um, I, as I said before, teams are coming to me wanting to build logic models for their own for their own teams, and it's it's been a really really great thing to see. Um, there's still a lot of work to do, but uh, we're I'm starting to see that there's a there's a culture now being being supported around wanting to wanting to talk about our outcomes versus our our outputs and at the you know kind of in the technology sector in the in the corporate philanthropy sector you get a lot of people who uh, 
who want to be the best, who want to be first and who want to be best. And so I've also leveraged that as well, saying, hey, all the cool kids are doing this. We should be doing it too. So that's definitely caught on. So it's, 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 it's just as much about changing a mindset as it is implementing effective, kind of an effective framework and effective processes. And so this is something that I wanted to show. Um, you don't necessarily need to look too, too much, you know, read too much into it. There are a lot of words on this, but really this is a way where we can actually show uh, colleagues throughout Salesforce kind of the, the thinking around what we're doing, around kind of logic modeling, data collection, data analysis and reporting, and that it all has a, um, all has a basis in learning. You know, that it's not just about kind of compliance, but really it's about taking M&E and bringing it to, to learning. And so I share this slide with my colleagues all the time to help to educate them about what it is that we're trying to do, what it is that, that the evaluators in the organization, all, all two of us, are, are trying to do. So this is just, you know, it's, it's, there's, there is a lot of education that goes on kind of independent of all of the, um, the all of the, you know, all of the, all of the processes. That, that, that were being built, that are being built as well. So what are some issues? Uh, thinking about, thinking about this broad, more broadly, what are some issues to consider if you wanna get involved or if you're, if you're doing some evaluations in, in this kind of intersected space? The first one is providing stakeholder support or technical assistance. Um, I think a lot about uh, the work that Hallie Preskill and Rosalie Torres have done around evaluator role. And I definitely find myself, especially working for a technology organization, that the technical assistance piece becomes very important to do. To do. Um, I end up talking to customers quite a bit about their, their technical issues around setting up, um, setting up measurement and evaluation systems, which isn't necessarily my job, but it's a way for me to learn about how others in the field are doing are doing this work, and it allows me to to test my knowledge as well. Like it's it's kind of an unavoidable part of the work. Um, you know, we're evaluators. We sh we just we want to evaluate, but providing this this support ends up becoming a way of of building credibility, which is something that that is that is really important. That, that you know, if you want to continue to do this work. Um, you know, having that credibility, establishing it early, and and sharing it out often is is going to be really really important. The next issue is data ownership versus data you know, or data partnership. So do you want do you want everything in the si in silos or do you want everybody to have access to everything? Um, I think about a recent uh, presentation um, that that my colleagues and I gave with uh, colleagues from the Wikimedia Foundation and from Google. And the Wikipedia, the Wikimedia Foundation, which runs Wikipedia, I mean, they're all about data being as open as, as, as possible, that knowledge should be as free flowing as possible. Whereas us at Salesforce, we have a saying around the, around the office that trust is our number one value, that data security usually trumps issues of, of ownership and partnership. So it's, 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 a, it's a difficult thing to think about because it really depends on it really depends on who who your audience is, who you're working with, and 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 it be, yeah, this this issue around data becomes becomes really really important to to think about. And the next one is I, I and I alluded to it a little bit earlier. This learning versus public relations or marketing. Um, oftentimes in our work, we see this pull between creating creating evaluations that are that go to compliance. And evaluations that go to learning, and there's another wrinkle in that around around PR. And you know, I work for I work for the nonprofit arm of a corporation, and they like talking about the good things. And it's and it's important again with changing this mindset to really focus on. It's not about good or bad. I mean, it's about did this happen or did it not happen, and and trying to take trying to take some kind of the judgment out, but also you know, a, you know, trying to allow a space for, for us to be vulnerable and for us to learn from our work. Um, another, another way that this comes up uh, is around the use of qualitative inquiry. 
because oftentimes marketing will go out and they'll interview the most successful customers and that's seen as oh that, there's there's your qualitative data you you've got all of that and we have to say no you know this wasn't this wasn't collected in a rigorous enough way <laughs> like we needed we need a we need something a bit different and so it's it's working with an organization to really push the learning as opposed to just creating things for really nice reports or really nice infographics that really don't say the you know the, doesn't tell the true story and then <clears throat> something that's becoming more and more important in this sector is the consideration of valuation kind of the difference between evaluation evaluation and social impact measurement and that's becoming that's becoming more um, more important in the space um, wanting to conduct ROI wanting to return on investment analysis wanting to focus on the triple bottom line of people profit and planet um, there's an incredible opportunity in the social impact measurement space and you know billions upon billions of dollars are available for for companies to um, to try to make a little better place and so to be able to evaluate in that space um, is a great opportunity for us, but we have to also be able to look at things related to business value. And it's something that I'm starting to do in my work, and this is really the first place where I've, I've had to do that. And then finally, this issue of reporting standards. There are more and more reporting standards being, um, being introduced and more and more that are being paid attention to like um, Iris from the from the GIN, the Global Impact Investing Network, the B Corporation Impact Assessment, the IATI standards, the SDGs, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and so how do you make your evaluation work fit into some of these reporting into some of these reporting guidelines, while also answering those important questions that need to be answered from from your organizations, and so. That's definitely that's that's definitely something that um, that I'm that, that I'm working with because I I definitely all all four um, of the reporting standards on this on this slide are ones that I'm being asked to to work on. So how do I reconcile that with the learning that needs to happen for my organization? It kind of it goes a little bit to the the learning versus compliance thing again. So. What are some useful skills to have while, while evaluating in, in this space? So I think things that I thought um, evaluator skills that the tech sector needs is really a focus on utilization, um, being able to add value quickly and to create useful as well as used findings. There's a big difference between creating something useful and then creating something that is used. And so being able to really focus on making things useful and, and used and utilized is, is, a really important, is a really important skill to have. Um, adaptability is, is another one. Um, I think if, if an evaluator insists on using one particular approach, that evaluator is not going to last long. So thinking about um, what Mew and, and Donaldson call theory knitting, um, bringing multiple theories to bear when, when evaluating and learning that different people need to see different types of products and being willing to maybe write a longer report for some and doing an executive summary or an infographic for others is, is really important. And, and then the ability to produce. Um, I had that slide earlier that showed you where I've been trained, what experience I have. That just got my foot in the door. What really matters is, are you able to produce? Are you able to do things quickly, but with the level of rigor that, that needs, you know, that, that evaluate, the evaluation process needs to have. So that's what really gets you to stay. Um, nobody calls me Dr. Barella unless they're, they're, they're making fun of me so it doesn't really matter uh, what, what what kind of credentials I have it's can I do the work and I think as evaluators we recognize that uh, pretty well and so that's a great um, that's a great tool that's a great skill to have as well and then some other skills that the text the tech sector doesn't know it needs yet um, I think as evaluators we have this ability to see the forest for the trees we're able to see 
what's happening on the ground as well as lift it up to see what's what's happening in a broader you know, with broader organizational strategy and to be able to go back and forth between those is is really important um there's also in there's also this desire to keep building the next thing and moving forward and moving forward and moving forward and I think as evaluators, we have an ability to help with reflection, which doesn't happen very often. So how can we look back to go forward? How can we actually learn from what we've done and not just go on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing? Because we also don't want to build the same thing over and over again. Um, and then there's also this, this methodological shepherding with rigor. Um, really working with colleagues to make sure that they understand that you know the questions that need to be answered are going to determine the methods being being used um something that i found is um people people on corporate philanthropy are very comfortable with numbers they're not nearly as comfortable with qualitative and qualitative information um and and that everything doesn't need to be quantified sometimes and so when you're building a system you can build in some qualitative inquiry and and do it do it rigorously do it well and and work with an organization to show that you know that data come in data come in all forms not just as financials and so how can we use that to really tell the story of our of our social impact um and then the final thing about mixed methods yeah it's more than just um giving somebody a survey and then talking to them for a couple of minutes mixed methods has its own methodology and and that's something that, that i think a lot of you know, a lot of people in the corporate philanthropy space would need some need some good education on And so, so yeah, so that was um, that was that was my my talk. And so, let's look at some of the questions. Okay. Hi, Eric. Sorry, I um, just heard you. Um, I'm going to read you some of the questions we compiled, uh, and then give you back the floor. Sorry for interrupting you. Um, just um, a quick reminder: we will only have five minutes for questions before um, the break, before we start the second session. Um, so one of the questions we have from Kendra Castleberry is, what kind of data collection do you find more useful for Salesforce? Uh, then David Fetterman, who's our next speaker, uh, asked, do you consider your evaluation work to become a part of the actual intervention itself by having folks reflect on what they are doing? Uh, and then Bianca Ambrose Moorhead has asked, what do you see as the difference between valuation versus evaluation? One perspective would say that valuation would be part of a worth determination. And so a risk could be to focus exclusively on worth to the exclusion of merit or significance. Um, Eric, I will now be pasting these questions into your uh, private chat so you can see them um, as well. I'm giving you back the floor now. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you for those questions, Sophia. Thank you for thank, thank, thank you to, to all of you for the, for the for the questions. So first off, what kind of data collection do I find more useful for Salesforce? Um, it really depends on it depends on my timeline, and it depends on those questions that I'm that I'm trying to that I'm trying to answer. Um, I find that it, it both quantitative and qualitative, both information about um, kind of user trends, kind of customer trends and customer patterns, as well as the 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 meatier information, the meatier kind of narrative qualitative information about what that usage looks like, is is both is, is both really important. Um, a lot of my colleagues think that the, the quantitative data are, are the data that they really that they really want, but inevitably they'll look at the quantitative data and say, well, what does that actually mean? What does it actually look like? So they're they're often going to the to the so what, and um, and, and and I kind of laugh a little bit because I know that that's that's where they that's where they want to go, and so inevitably it comes back to the qualitative as well. So I find I find both to be useful in their in their own ways. Um, as far as considering my, my evaluation work to become a part of the actual intervention itself by having folks reflect on what they're doing, um, absolutely. Um, I, think, 
I think that's what that's what good evaluation should do. And I think it really should, you know, it should ask us those questions about about whether, you know, whether we're actually doing what we what we're supposed to be doing or doing the right things. And so by creating the processes um, and kind of taking them out of the hands of the people who would be trying to do that anyway, um, and, and being able to give the information back to them, it allows them to actually think about that. And actually, you know, I, I do a lot of facilitation around thinking about that work. So, so absolutely, this evaluation really does become part of the, it should become part of the intervention itself. And the difference between valuation and, ev and evaluation, uh, Bianca, as far as being risky to focus exclusively on worth um, versus merit or significance, uh, you're absolutely right. And I think, um, and I think what, what the way that I've done it is seeing them, seeing it as a both and. So that valuation tells you one piece of the, one piece of the story, but it, it just tells you the value of, of what's actually going out there. So the valuation piece I say is a really, really great output and say like, that's kind of the, the, the number one output we have, but that we really do want to take it to the outcome level. And so by just focusing on valuation, by just focusing on, on, on worth, you're not focusing on merit. You're not focusing on the actual effectiveness of the work that you're doing. And so what I've really worked hard to do, and what I actually talk to colleagues about all the time, is how do we, how do we have the two as part of evaluation work? How do we, how do we have how do we have the valuation piece on one side and how do we have the evaluation stuff on the other and how do we bring them together so that people see it as, oh, you know, that's like the valuation piece is a jumping off point, it's a starting point. And then we go to, we go to the, the deeper questions around, around overall kind of program, you know, program merit and program significance.